Hello, and welcome to my countdown of my favorite films of 2019. It was a great year for cinema, and tougher than usual cutting my list down to 10 movies. Let's get into it. Number 10, Knives Out. Mr. Blanc, I just buried my father who committed suicide. Why are you here? I suspect foul play. I have eliminated no suspects. Ryan Johnson's follow-up to Star Wars The Last Jedi is a send-up to the classic Agatha Christie whodunit and one of 2019's most enjoyable films. We've seen Johnson put a new spin on classic genres before with his 2005 debut film, Brick. With Knives Out, he has perfected the art. The film follows flashy detective Benoit Blanc as he investigates the death of Harlan Thromby, a celebrated crime novelist and patriarch of an eccentric and dysfunctional family. Instead of revealing the murder at the end of the film, Johnson reveals the truth about halfway through, and the story then spins out from there. Knives Out features an all-star cast that is fun to watch. They all play their characters pretty broad. Daniel Craig relishes his role of the southern detective Blanc. Chris Evans plays the loathsome grandson Ransom, ridding himself of Captain America's Boy Scout persona. That's some heavy-duty conjecture. Funny, Ransom, you skipped the funeral, but you're early for the will reading. Up your ass. Very nice, oh, Ransom. 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 You gotta do this more right. often. There are indeed a lot of big performances in Knives Out, but the anchor of the film is Anna de Armas, as Harlan's trusted nurse, Marta. The family claims she is part of the family, yet can't bother to remember if she is from Paraguay or Brazil. De Armas plays Marta with a sincerity and frustration that is evident throughout the film and grounds the message of the film in the real world. Knives Out is a ton of fun, features a great cast, a new take on an old genre, and one of the best closing shots of 2019. Number 9, Uncut Gems. I made a crazy risk to gamble. And it's about to pay off. I've never enjoyed a panic attack so much. With Uncut Gems, the Safdie brothers give us a manic journey into the heart of the New York Diamond District, where charismatic jeweler Howard Ratner, played feverishly by Adam Sandler, makes a high-stakes bet that could lead to his biggest score yet, or his downfall. Josh and Benny Safdie are positioning themselves as the directing team of the future with this film. They have an impeccable way of managing tension and tempo, and it is on full display. The Safdie brothers give us a New York that is greasy and grimy, and populated by people who are the same. Inspired by the Scorsese films of the 70s, we get a crime thriller as well as a character piece. The chaotic feel of the film is emphasized by a score from Daniel Lopatin that utilizes synths, saxophones, and meditation bowls. It delivers a sound that is both cosmic and jazzy, sometimes complementing what we are seeing on screen or purposely juxtaposing it. Uncut Gems hinges on Adam Sandler, and he delivers. I heard you free surf at your fucking swimming pool. I, you know how that makes me feel? Never free you think surf is more important than I don't know who said that. He manifests a lot of the same energy of some of his previous roles, but twists them into tragic and toxic qualities that make Howard a troubled character. He is quick-tempered and prone to hysteric yelling and neurotic rambling. I hope more directors make use of Sandler's obvious dramatic chops after this stellar performance. This is me. This is how I went. Number eight, Marriage Story. What I love about Nicole, she is a mother who plays, really plays. What I love about Charlie, he loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate, like waking up at night. Marriage Story is a comedy drama written and directed by Noah Baumbach. It stars Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson as theater director Charlie and his actress wife Nicole, and follows them as they fumble their way through a divorce. A lovely score from Randy Newman helps set the tone as Charlie and Nicole read letters about why they love their partner, only to find out the letters were written for their divorce mediator and their marriage is all but over. This trick gives you a history and an investment in this relationship. You can see that there once was love there, which makes what follows so painful. The film does a tremendous job of balancing humor and heartache. There are scenes of grief and anger, moments of hope as well. 
Marriage Story plays out more like a stage play than a film, which makes sense given the characters' occupations. The performances from Driver and Johansson are honest and emotional and make the film. A highlight of the film is a scene where Driver sings Being Alive from Sondheim's company in full. It's a scene that feels like it should be out of place, but Driver sells it with conviction, and it becomes the emotional crux of the film. Someone to need you too much Someone to know you too well Someone to pull you up short To put you through Mary's hell. Story was released by Netflix, making it widely seen and debated. For me, it was a film that featured a director and two leads at the height of their game. Number seven, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And cut! That was the best acting I've ever seen in my whole life. Like you. With Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino has delivered a mostly mature and reflective film. There is so much to love about it. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood follows an aging television actor, Rick Dalton, and his stunt double, Cliff Booth, as they strive to make it in the movies during the final years of Hollywood's golden age of cinema. I wish I could spend forever with Rick and Cliff, played by Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, respectively. DiCaprio and Pitt are great together, and on their own. They each get scenes to shine. Blind. Tarantino utilizes Pitt's charm and humor in the best ways. DiCaprio shows a more vulnerable side that I don't think we've seen much from him lately. Margot Robbie is a magnetic present as Sharon Tate. The scenes she gets are whimsical, but have a foreboding shadow hanging over them. The production design is fantastic. The sets and streets feel lived in. The picture quality feels like it's been sitting out in the sun too long. The sound design is pitch perfect as well. The music and sounds coming from the radios, TVs, and record players really bring 60s Hollywood to life. The film's pace is a bit meandering, which may turn some people off, but I quite enjoyed just driving around with the characters listening to the radio, not really sure where it might take us. The ending feels a bit rushed, as it tries to wrap everything up and get us to the fateful night of the Manson murders. And I do have issues with the ending. Not the revisionist history part, I think that's great. Old Hollywood paves the way for new Hollywood, reclaiming Sharon Tate's life so she's not just a victim. It is a fairy tale after all, but the gleeful violence is sadistic and unnecessary, even if it is one of Charles Manson's murderous hippies. And I know that's Tarantino's thing, but for a movie that is otherwise very thoughtful and restrained, it left a bad taste in my mouth. There's still enough good things going on in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that it lands at number 7 on my list. Number six, Little Women. I'm working on a novel. It is a story of my life and my sisters. Make it short and spicy. And if the main character is a girl, make sure she's married by the end. Ow, Joe! This is the 16th screen adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. And Greta Gerwig's version gives us a fresh take on the classic novel. Gerwig tells the story of Joe March and her sisters in a non-linear fashion starting with Joe in New York, trying to make it as a writer, and remembering back on her childhood with her sisters. This does a few things I like for the story. It introduces us to Professor Bear and establishes Joe's relationship with him early on in the story, rather than his arrival coming out of left field in the end. It also gives us scenes with Amy and Laurie early on, so their romance doesn't seem to come out of nowhere. Sorry if I just ruined a 150-year-old novel. Aside from that, the nonlinear structure allows Gerwig to sandwich events on top of each other, enhancing thematic elements of the story. Beth's death is sequenced next to Meg's wedding. This isn't just a juxtaposition of happy and sad events, but also representing two moments Joe feels like she lost a sister. Greta Gerwig wrote a fantastic script that feels modern while not really altering the source material. Her script erases the gap between Louisa May Alcott and Joe March. It's a film about creating art and the difficulties therein. I just, I just feel, I just feel like women, they, they have minds 
and they have souls as well as just hearts and they've got ambition and they've got talent as well as just beauty and I'm so sick of people saying that that love is just all a woman is fit for I'm so sick of it but I'm I'm so lonely Little Women features great performances from its cast Saoirse Ronan as Joe is both determined and loving Florence Pugh is a highlight as the often hated Amy. Pew gives Amy a bit of a redemption, playing her as an equally smart and determined counterpart to Joe. I think the poets might disagree. Well, I'm not a poet. Little Women continues Greta Gerwig's streak of making expertly crafted films that speak to the complexities of being a young woman and forging your place in the world. Number five. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Ça fait des années que je rêve de faire ça. Mourir. Courir. Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a beautiful period film from French writer-director Celine Sciamma. Set in 1760s Brittany, France, Portrait of a Lady on Fire introduces us to a talented painter, Marianne, who is commissioned to paint the wedding portrait of a young aristocrat, Heloise. Marianne arrives at the family's Gothic estate to find a family in mourning and a subject who doesn't want to be painted. Marianne must pose as Eloise's walking companion, and while they go on these walks, Marianne is always gazing and studying Eloise, taking her in. Meanwhile, Heloise does the same of Marianne. Director Shiyama brings out great performances from her actors. Portrait of a Lady on Fire features beautiful costumes and set designs. Cinematographer Claire Mathon supplies the film with an array of vivid images that play on the artistic themes of the film. Exteriors show off sweeping vistas of the Brittany Ocean side, while in contrast the interiors are dark, lit with the chiaroscuro of a Cravaggio painting. Largely a film about love, it's also about the creative process and the joys, struggles, and memories captured in a work of art. A romance between two women, directed and shot by women. This is a feminist work and puts the female gaze front and center. Both leads are mesmerizing. Nomi Merlot, as Marianne, is observant and tender. Adele Hanel gives Eloise a mysterious playfulness. Hanel's fair complexion and features contrast Merlot's dark hair and eyes that are continuously studying her as she paints. The two play well off of each other. Most scenes consist of the two just talking back and forth. Sometimes they're joined by Eloise's maid. The chemistry and tension is palpable during their scenes. You believe in the romance and feel the pain and desire in their characters and the story. Number four, A Hidden Life. Remember the day when we first met? You were shy like now. I remember that motorcycle. Terrence Malick is back. After a string of somewhat disappointing films, Malik returns with a film that marries his love of cinematic montage with a straightforward narrative. A Hidden Life is the true story of Austrian Franz Jagerstatter, a conscientious objector who defied the Nazi party and refused to fight in World War II. The film is based on real letters between Franz and his wife Fanny. Those letters are presented in whispered hushes over floating camera movements that capture the breathtaking mountain scenery and are backed by the weepy violin of Jane Newton Howard's score. The film touches on many of the same spiritual and philosophical questions that have played Malik in the past. It's also decidedly more political, taking on fascism and questioning religious institutions that align themselves with such obvious horrors. We're killing innocent people. Raiding other countries, preying on the weak. 
And the priests call them heroes, even saints. The soldiers, the doers. It might be that the other ones are the heroes. Malik is working with a new cinematographer, Jorg Widmer. Widmer has worked as a camera operator for Malik on his last four films behind Emmanuel Lubezki. The signature style is still there, the idealized shots of nature basked in natural light. But Widmer also uses more static shots and wide-angle lenses. This allows us to see the church steeples loom overhead and the dark clouds gather on their idyllic Eden. It's a plodding and quiet film about resistance and sacrifice and the unwavering strength it requires to do both. Number three, The Irishman. Your friend choose love before. When I was young, I, I thought house painters painted houses. <laughs> what did I know? I was a working guy. Martin Scorsese has long stood as one of my favorite directors, and his mobster films hold a soft spot in my heart. Recently, I've wrestled with the cost of seeing and enjoying all of the violence and machismo these films offer. Apparently, Marty has been wrestling with it, too. The Irishman seems to be a culmination of all of Scorsese's mobster pictures. It offers reflection and repentance as it ruminates on the cost of living such a violent life. The Irishman brings Scorsese back with Robert De Niro, who plays Frank Sheeran, a mob hitman who builds a close relationship with Jimmy Hoffa. Scorsese brings back some other actors closely associated with the genre as well. Joe Pesci plays Frank's mentor, Russell Buffalino, and Al Pacino hams it up as a larger-than-life Jimmy Hoffa. The Irishman takes its time meandering through three different timelines, and while there are violent moments, most of the film focuses on the consequences of these moments and the quiet conversations in between. And while this film doesn't have the same frantic pace as some of Scorsese's previous films, it still gripped me for the full three and a half hour runtime, mostly due to the terrific performances from De Niro and Pesci. Tony told the old man to tell me, to tell you, mm -hmm. it's what it is. What it is, it's what it is. They wouldn't dare. De Niro does some of his best work in decades as Frank Sheeran. He brings a sadness to the scenes where he plays an older Frank, living out the last days of his life in a nursing home. Pesci delivers a performance unlike anything we've seen from him. In the past, his characters have been the fast-talking, quick-tempered hotheads. He's much more calculated in this film. He brings a quiet power and underlying danger to Russell Buffalino. Much has been said about the digital de-aging technology used to make the actors look younger in the film. It's not great, but it's a valiant effort, and after a while, I got used to it, minus a few scenes where it was obvious I was looking at the body of an 80-year-old man beat a man on the streets. In the end, it's what it is. The Irishman is an amazing feat of filmmaking and a fitting and reflective conclusion to this part of Marty and the Gang's filmography. Number 2. Parasite. 부모님 얼굴도 뵙고 좋더라 건강들 하시고 일거리가 없으셔도 네가 내 대신 얘 과외 선생님 좀 해줘라 영어 대학생인 척하라는 거야? 구라를 좀 치지 뭐 Parasite is a dark humor thriller that will keep you on the edge of your seat with its multiple twists and turns though it's not just exciting plot twists that director Bong Joon-ho has on his mind the movie is so metaphorical as character Kai Jung would say Bong has made a biting commentary on class dynamics as well Parasite introduces us to the poor family of Kim Kai-woo, folding pizza boxes for cash in their dank, bug-infested basement apartment. When Kim Kai-woo is offered a chance to tutor a young girl from the well-to-do Park family, he sees it as an opportunity to get his whole family work in their opulent glass house. Things are looking up for the Kim family, until they aren't. Parasite features a strong cast full of intriguing performances. <laughs> King Ho Song is particularly great as the father of the Kim family. His soft face and eyes are able to communicate a certain desperation and sadness to a lot of scenes. 
The centerpiece of Parasite is the park's house. The production and set design are meticulous. The house design is used to highlight themes as well as help tell the story. The storytelling in Parasite is top notch as well. There are setups and payoffs and the audience is lulled into a sense of comfort, just like the Kims, and then the rug is pulled out from under you. Parasite is an exciting and thought provoking movie that will be talked about for years to come. Number one, The Last Black Man in San Francisco. We built these ships, dredged these canals. In the San Francisco they never knew existed. This is our home. The Last Black Man in San Francisco is a stunning debut film collaboration from director Joe Talbot and star Jimmy Fails. The duo wrote the film together, which is loosely based on Jimmy's own story. The film revolves around a beautiful Victorian home in San Francisco that formerly belonged to Jimmy's family. Gentrification has placed the home in the hands of a new family, but Jimmy and his friend Montgomery still dream of restoring the house to its former beauty, and one day, moving back home. The story is told like a misremembered dream, woozy and fantastical, a fairy tale about a deposed prince reclaiming his throne. Jimmy and Montgomery San Francisco comes alive through the striking cinematography. The film opens with the beautiful image of Jimmy and Montgomery riding tandem on a skateboard, gliding through the streets of San Francisco. The city, the homes, and the characters that inhabit them are shot lovingly. Talbot packs the film with oddball details that make their version of San Francisco unique. We can see from his gingerbread trim, this was built sometime in the 1850s. Uh, 1946. I'm gonna have to disagree with you there, dude, man. No architect in the 1940s was building in this style. That's probably true, but this wasn't built by an architect. My grandfather built this. The movie also features a terrific first score from Emile Masseri that is grand and soaring, adding to this romantic view of San Francisco. The film covers a lot of important themes, but really boils down to being a story about friendship and finding your place in the world. It really resonated with me, and that's why The Last Black Man in San Francisco is my favorite film of 2019. If you're going to San